Hello everyone and welcome to this car profile of the Aston Martin DBR9 GT1. Now this is the latest and most recent addition to the Group 3 category in GT Sport. But of course it's a GT1 car which first debuted at Spring 12 Hour in 2005. And it actually won on its debut which is pretty good going to be honest with you. Uh, two years later it um, won at Le Mans and then the year after that it won again at Le Mans in its category. Of course GT1 category. Now, the car in its GT1 form factor is front-engined rear-wheel drive, uh, and that engine is a 5.9-litre V12, so absolutely massive engine, uh, with its uh, performance being 599 brake horsepower and weighing in at just 1,100 kilograms. So a very fast car there, very powerful, very light. So you can see why it was in the GT1 class. However... We are talking about the Group 3 class here, the GT3 class in GT Sport. So it does have to have a balance of performance. Now in terms of that performance, the car now drops power. So from 599 down to 564. That means it's at 94% performance in terms of power. And then in terms of weight, it has a load of ballast added here. So it goes from 1,100 up to 1,243 kilograms. It really is heavy. So it loses power and gains weight. So you can definitely feel that in the test that we will have a look at shortly. Now, I wanted to, in addition, just to give you these scores that are in the settings of the car that you can see. Um, so basically, on the left-hand side, there are some scores, basically, for what the car is like in terms of a mini profile so on racing car tires because this changes on tires um the max speed 6.4 acceleration 5.3 braking 3.9 cornering 4.0 and stability 6.6 .6. and i think that's actually around about right to be honest as you'll see from my testing which i've already done before i've actually done this introduction part of it now, in terms of what we're going to do, we're going to look at three tracks. We've dropped brands, and I can explain separately for that if you really want to know. We're going to look at Dragon Trail Seaside, Interlagos, and then Suzuka. And then what we're also going to do is a grid start to have a look at the acceleration off the line using Traction Control 1. We're also going to look at fuel, and we're also going to look at tyres to give you a good overall idea about this car and give you a full car profile. So this is going to be the car profile of the Aston Martin DBR9 GT1. Let's jump to Dragon Trail Seaside. So here we are at Dragon Trail Seaside. And the reason we're at this circuit is to test the curbs and also the high-speed performance of a car. It's a very high-speed circuit. You'll always see Peugeot Vision Grand Turismo cars always near the front. And that's why we're testing it here. So coming into this first corner, I found quite often that I would always understeer on the exit of here. Now this is the one exception of course, um, because this is actually my fastest lap. I'm only going to show you the fastest laps at each of the circuits. Uh, coming through here, again lots of understeer there. I found always the car was understeering a lot. And I think that is because of the added weight. There's so much more weight in there, the car's struggling to turn. And I think that's critical here. Coming up to these S's, same thing again. I found that I was waiting to go on the power. Look at that, having to really wait, having to really wait. I had to come off again to go again. And it, it was a real struggle to get the power down. Now, in terms of riding the curbs, you could ride the curbs all day. The car is very, very stable. And we saw that with the numbers earlier on, actually. And that's what I was more uh, pointing towards to. Now, in terms of braking, coming up to this hairpin here, this right hand or near hairpin, um, I found the braking on this car atrocious. It was just awful. I had to brake really early in this car in order for it to stop, um, which is quite concerning, really, actually. So coming through here, uh, I had to really lift. Occasionally, the car would bounce there, and it would get a little bit of air. Again, I think that might be the weight with the bounce, just forcing the car a little bit higher. Uh, and with the braking, it's the weight again. I think it's the weight of the car which is critical here. So just coming into this last turn now, I found that actually if you stayed lower down in terms of the gears, uh, rather than hitting the limiter all the time, you actually save time. And actually going to that very, very limit doesn't work out. So I always change gear the minute I got to the end of the bar. Now we've got a 38-1 there. I, am, I, I would expect them, uh, any car really, to be in the 37. So struggling here at Drunk Trail Seaside there. And remember, we always look at optimums. Now I'm not going to be putting this on the bounce performance old spreadsheet that I have but there is going to be a new leaderboard shortly uh, and all the information is going to go on there including a new scoring system in terms of risk as well uh, and tyre wear and fuel but we'll get on to that shortly. So we come to Intel Argos and here we're testing the undulations of the car again curbs uh, and it's a little bit of a power circuit Intel Argos as well so we can see the power of the car. 
Now it does test stability at Interlagos quite a lot because of the uphill, downhill, change of direction. Um, so it is kind of critical for handling. Uh, and uh, coming through to the end of this first sector here and turning left, obviously we've got the outside AstroTurf. Uh, I actually could go on that and even if the car oversteered a little bit, I could catch it very easily. So in, in terms of stability, the car has a lot of it. And that's something that may be useful for newcomers to the game. So if you are new and you want to try a very stable car, this could be the one for you. Although, as I say, it is a little bit slow. Or appears a little bit slow anyway. So coming into this uh, handling section here, the right, then the left. Again, you can see how stable it is here. We're just staying in second gear. Round we go. No real issues here at all in terms of driving this car. Um, just understeer. We're having to be very patient. You can see again, look, we're having to be patient. Waiting, waiting, waiting before we can put the power on. We're down this left-hander. Again, we're going to have to lift a lot there. You can see that heavy lift uh, as we come into the braking zone. Uh, again, this last corner, you're having to wait. Now, I was a bit unsure, second or third gear here. So you can see I quickly changed to third there. And then we head up the hill. Obviously, this tests the power of the car. As I say here, stability was tested and it's very stable. And we saw it dragging trail as well. Over curbs, it's very stable. Um, it doesn't really oversteer that much. I'm assuming the weight just holds it back there. And obviously, the power decrease helps as well. Uh, that's a 31.8. I'd expect lots of cars here to be much lower in the 31s. Uh, optimum there, a 31.6, which is the actual time we will use. So you can see that for Interlagos. Now, you're probably questioning why we're using racing hard tyres. That's the best way to balance it. It shows where a car is unstable uh, and where it isn't. It'll also really pick out the handling cars versus the non-handling cars. So we come to Suzuka. Now, Suzuka was actually very hard initially because trail braking in this car is very difficult. You can see I'm having to come on and off the brake. So every time I try to ride that brake, trail brake into the corners, I actually found the car would understeer more. Now, I'm assuming that's because there's just too much going on with the front tyres. So I had to keep lifting off that brake to get it turned in. Now, coming through these S's, again, it's very stable. It's more about patience with the understeer that we have with this car. Um, so if you are driving it, just be careful of that as we come through this left-hander. Now, in terms of target times, on my old spreadsheet, it was all in the 58s. Now, we did have a patch which did change the handling of all cars substantially, which is why we're not using that old spreadsheet. Uh, so I, I am still expecting cars to be in that 58 margin, and we are nowhere near it at the moment. We're in the 59s. Um, I expect most cars to be in the 58, especially handling cars. Um, but let's talk about this hairpin, actually. This is a kind of critical corner. Um, you see, I, I'm in second gear there. Now, I couldn't decide between first or second. First, it got the car a little bit more rotated, but I just struggled out the corners. Second, it doesn't. It feels like it's bogging down, but it isn't. But it will get you out the corner fine. So, again, it's one of those where actually being in a slightly lower gear is actually fairly useful for the car. Quick through spoon, again, look, I'm just really, really monitoring that understeer, going to the very edge of the kerbin as we come round here. We accelerate now towards the 130R. Now, something very key for 130R, I've never experienced this with any car. This car can actually go on the outside AstroTurf at 130R and survive. I've, I don't know of any other car that's able to do this. So, it obviously, come through here. That exit AstroTurf there, I could even go on it, the, the uh, darker green stuff, and it would survive. It would handle itself fine. Very unusual. Um, so that shows how stable this car is with that additional weight that it's got to make it a Group 3 car. Even so, we're going to come round towards the end of the lap here. And this is going to be a 59.7. Uh, and our overall optimum uh, is down at 59.6. I'm not sure whether that changes. We'll just jump now. No, it stays at 59.6. So I do think there's there's obviously more time there. I mean, I'm only jumping in 10 laps per um, circuit. But... As an initial, I do think it's struggling a little bit. It really is struggling. So what we're going to do now, test fuel and tyres. See, I'm flat to the floor here. We're going to test acceleration first, grid start, charge control on one. We're going to change gear and then we'll turn it off. And then we're going to measure where we hit 100 miles an hour here in terms of time. And there we go. So 7.216 seconds, I get to 100 miles an hour. So we're going to test this in the future, just zero to 100 miles an hour. See what it looks like. Let's continue on a little bit more. What we are going to do, and let me just explain it a little bit here. Fuel is on times 10, tyre wear is on times 10. I'm using racing soft tyres here to really get that tyre wear down. Now, this is just a custom race. I'm using Interlagos again because lots of corners, undulations in there. We should be able to test tyre wear here. Uh, and the fuel really does get hit here. So we do four laps. And you can see we've got a fuel and tyre, uh, fuel and tyres on the screen there. I'm on bumper cam just so we can see tyres clearly. 20%. We're going to use that in a scoring system in the future. You will see that scoring system in the very near future. Now, in addition to that, I've done this tie wear marker. And what this does is it every 10%. So 
So you can see that the front left tire there is around 78%, I would say. Uh, the front right tire is actually probably just below 70%, 69%. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to score all these tire wears up. And this gives us an overall score of tire wear. On top of all that, so you're getting loads of information from this. And I am going to put this all together for you. Uh, we're going to use this total time. Now, this total time is not critical. But what it should show is whether a car loses out on handling quite drastically with that tire wear. So what I'm going to do after this, of course, and once we have a second card to put on a sheet, I'm going to score all this up and put it in a, uh, a spreadsheet for you, a Google sheet, so you can view it whenever you want. A bit like the old system, but with a bit better scoring system. It should show you risk indicators of driving a car uh, and some of the overall stuff. Now, this has been the new car profile. And it's been the Aston Martin DBR9 GT1 car. I hope you've enjoyed this new format. Plenty more car profiles to come. We are going to be looking at Group 4 as well at some point. A lot of the Group 3, unless it's a drastic change, I will do in the background and just add to that spreadsheet and let you know when it's done. Uh, but in terms of Group 4, that will be coming very soon. And again, that tyre wear indicator is going to be so, so critical. Uh, because we can look at that and really get a good idea of how a car is actually performing. But that is going to be it for me now. The old car playlists are on your screen right now if you want to check out any of those. Some good ones in there if you've got a particular favourite. My logo's there if you want to subscribe. But that's going to be it for me now, guys. Thanks very much for watching. I will see you in the next video.